I'm here to talk about Ethereum governance, or one of the many ways to think about Ethereum governance, I suppose. Less philosophical, it's entirely what is happening today, who are the organizations involved, what's the history of it. First, a little bit about me. Um, I have been involved in cryptocurrency since about 2011. I worked at a bank for a few years, then Ethereum Foundation, and I uh, co-founded Oaken Innovations um, and serve as an advisor there. I have one wife, Laura, top left, and uh, three cats. Uh, top right is Vivian, bottom left is Fry, and bottom right is Lilu. So I'm going to start with Vlad's definition of governance. Um, it's the process by which we attempt to establish uh, the legitimacy of decisions, decision-making processes, and related governance norms and expectations. I just like that definition a lot, so I wanted to throw it into my slides. I think it makes it really, I think it really boils it down well for what most blockchain governance discussions kind of come down to, in a way. Um, so that's just kind of how I feel about the definition. Okay, so let me give you a history of kind of what governance or the you know powers of Ethereum, what, what that was back in the day. So or 2014, early 2015, all clients and development tools were developed by the Ethereum Foundation. Um, all the co-founders were there, all the first developers, DevCon Zero had about 50 people, and uh, that's kind of where it was all centralized, you can think of it that way. Granted, it was so such a small project, you can't really blame it for not being decentralized yet. Uh, 2015 to 2016, outside entities started to form and leave the Ethereum Foundation. Uh, we had stuff like consensus happening. Uh, parity happened around 2016, I believe, um, and other stuff like that. I'm just keeping time. Um, and then 2016, uh, enterprise Ethereum discussion started on a Skype chat between a lot of enterprises who are starting to get interested in it, and then eventually the Ethereum Enterprise Alliance formed. Um, more infrastructure is now being developed by third parties. We have MetaMask, we have Infura. They probably started a little bit before 2016, but uh, you, you start seeing them be a lot more used. Um, and then 2017, Enterprise Ethereum brings traditional companies into Ethereum, and that's more visible from a government and academic interest perspective. You have IC3 from Cornell University. You have Stanford, uh, Harvard. Um, I think Cambridge is another big one. Um, UCLA, there's just a lot of different um, blockchain organizations within colleges and academic institutions now. What is it now? It is Vitalik holding a Lambo. Okay, so this is my favorite slide because it's the most aesthetically pleasing because it looks like stair steps, like climbing down, and I didn't plan for it that way until I noticed that all of them could do that. So, yeah, my favorite slide. Um, here are the current major players in the ecosystem that kind of contribute to a lot of the decisions being made, the direction that Ethereum is going, things like that. Uh, consensus is a big hub-and-spoke model, um, I guess, company, organization, uh, conglomerate, whatever you want to call it. And it has a bunch of different teams that all work you know, across teams and come up with their own projects, and then eventually some of them spin out into their own companies, others stay in and provide infrastructure. It's kind of a very, it's very hard to pin down what consensus is unless you've worked there. So, oh, even though you don't know, okay, yeah. So um, then there's the Web3 Foundation, which is working really hard across different technologies, including Definity, um, Ethereum, obviously, um, Polkadot and others to bring about the Web3 future that's been envisioned by people like Gavin Wood in the past. Um, Parity Technologies, uh, they uh, build the second biggest Ethereum client that was founded by Gavin Wood as one of the spinoffs from Ethereum Foundation. Um, the Ethereum Foundation, uh, they're hosting DevCon. I think they're pretty cool. I work there. And what they do is they provide uh, funding, support, grants other things to the Ethereum ecosystem. It's pretty much all about supporting the ecosystem and making sure things get done. EEA, uh, that's for enterprise Ethereum people. Fellowship of Ethereum Magicians is a disorganization, as Boris put it, of uh, people coming together to make technical standards, or to not make, but to basically review and talk about technical and sometimes philosophical standards within Ethereum. Um, we have the client devs. Uh, they get together during the all core developer meetings, which um, I'll show you a little bit more about in a second. That is um, 
those client devs, uh, you know, have a lot of input and they don't even always want it, but that's kind of what they end up doing. Then we have Ethereum improvement proposal editors. This is like our IETF standards. Um, and I'm an EIP editor. Um, so is Nick Johnson, for instance, and uh, Greg Colvin, who's around here somewhere. And so uh, then there's also highly used infrastructure tools, such as Infura, MyCrypto, and MetaMask. And they have a good say in the ecosystem as well. Here's an example of EIPs. There's the front page of the EIPs repo. It says, you know, the status terms, how to contribute, the types. And the most famous example of an EIP is the ERC-20 token standard, which defines the most basic type of token you can have in the Ethereum ecosystem that's cross-compatible um, via the smart contracts it produces. This is a screenshot of the core developer call. Um, this one in particular had about 30 people because it was a very contentious issue about issuance reduction. Um, core developer meetings happen every two weeks um, on Fridays. Uh, I think it's like 10 a.m. Eastern U.S. time. And uh, what we do is we try not to talk about controversial topics unless we absolutely have to, but it's all about low-level client and protocol development stuff. What's the next hard fork happening? How do we fix the network layer if there's something wrong? What are we going to do whenever Robston messes up? Um, what's everyone's client updates? Um, every time there's a new client that comes out, such as Pantheon, such as uh, Xtherium, we invite them to the call. At this point, I believe there is nine clients that are compatible with the current Ethereum network, which is incredible. And all of them are represented on this call. Um, the All Core Devs call kind of sparked other calls, including the eWASM community call, the Plasma Implementers call, and the ETH Implementers 2.0 call. ETH Implementers 2.0 call is incredibly interesting because it's people from across many, many different ecosystem organizations. Um, Plasma Implementers call as well um, is very, very diverse, I would say. Um, it's hard for Vitalik to keep up attending all of these because uh, he's definitely someone who would be valued at all of these. But there's just too many calls now. Too many. Here's the problems. EIPs in the all-core devs meetings are the only formal way that decisions are made. Um, the most technical stuff, we don't have enough people to actually help us out on these things. There's the same people making decisions over and over again because there's a lot to understand at the very complicated underlying Ethereum protocol. Um, and we have few good signaling systems or other methods to gauge community consensus whenever things happen. You can think back to the DAO, uh, for example. That was a very hard decision um, at the time. I can go on all day about the DAO. But the point is, uh, it was hard to gauge the community sentiment at the time. And then eventually, the call was made for what defaults were presented on the clients to go forward. Solutions involve more diverse groups and participants. Bake a loaf of doge bread. Create safe places for people to discuss things. Uh, encourage participation and outspoken opinions. Um, so safe places for Discord is important because we don't want to become toxic like Bitcoin, just straight up. So in order to do that, we need to have like a variety of places where we're all you know just nice to each other and not assholes. Um, encourage participation and outspoken opinions. Same vein, just listen to people. Um, more governance structures. Ethereum magicians came in, and I believe they're saving the day right now because we just had the all-core dev meetings and EIPs, and now they're coming in to really help structure the future of EIPs and other governance things with their rings model, which you may hear about later. And then continuous improvement on current structures. We're always trying to improve the core dev meetings, the EIP process, things like that. Are we centralized? Nope, we're too disorganized to be centralized. What can we do? Don't panic. We need to uh, develop good de governance structures. Um, I truly believe that the idea of figureheads are good early on in a blockchain project, but influence needs to be lessened over time. Uh, specifically in the case of Vitalik, um, you know, he's been basically the earlier on, he had a lot more influence. And today he's stepping back into more of a research role. And you won't even see him on the core dev calls. You won't see him commenting on major issues as much anymore. Um, he's out of the decision-making process in a lot of ways, and I think that's great, and I think that's purposeful, and I mean, I've confirmed that's purposeful from him. So um, that's something that I think is really, really important for um, the ecosystem to thrive and become more decentralized and more people take over. 
Um, and then look at tradition, like old school things like IETF and see how they're running and what you can do about things like rough consensus. I'm at Hudson Jameson on Twitter and at HudsonJameson.com. Thank you all so much. I hope I didn't go over my time.